You're listening to the Hour of the Time. I'm your host, William Cooper. Folks, have you taken the time out to call Swiss America Trading? If not, do it right now. Listen to what I have to say and then pick up the phone and do it right now. You can make your call during the musical lead-in to the rest of our program for tonight. It won't cost you a thing, and when you see the information you're going to get back from Swiss America Trading, under no obligation, I might add, you're going to be very happy that you made the call. Swiss America Trading has stuck by us all through these trying times. You know, you people out there don't realize what kind of controversy this program stirs up. You don't hear the attempts to discredit this program and try to get our sponsors to abandon us. People have called Craig Smith at Swiss America Trading. They have tried to get them to abandon this program because of the information that we have disclosed. And some of the names of those people would amaze you, would absolutely amaze you. And maybe at some later date we might decide to disclose that, but right now uh, we're not going to. The radio stations that broadcast this program also receive phone calls and letters, usually anonymous, with the end of trying to make them drop us. Swiss America Trading is stuck by us this whole time, so has WWCR and WRNO, because all of these people understand the meaning of the information that this program puts out to the world. And they know how important it is that you receive this information. Now, I've got to tell you, we received requests to be sponsored by many other people, products, companies, and we turned them all down. Uh, one reason is because some of them wanted to sponsor us with the intention of restricting what we say. Others, we didn't believe in those products or those people or those companies and could not, in good conscience, recommend them to anyone. But Swiss America Trading is different. We check them out thoroughly. They've never cheated anyone. In fact, they've been over backwards to make people happy, folks. They have uh, many of the investments available that we've recommended on this show. They have some that we don't know anything about and have not investigated. And they have some that we do not recommend. It is your business how you invest your money. But I tell you this, if you don't make a call and find out about how you can protect your assets against the coming economic trauma, then I would say that you are missing a beat here. You're doing something that you're going to regret later. Now remember, you're under no obligation. You're going to get some free information that you're going to really be happy with. You're going to be glad that you had a chance to read it. Call Swiss America right now, 1-800-289-2646. That's 1-800-289-2646. Let the experts there help you find a way to protect your assets. Everything that you've earned is at risk right now. Everything that you own is at risk right now. Everything that you have an equity interest in is at risk right now. Call Swiss America Trading at 1-800-289-2646. That's 1-800-289-2646. Now, by protecting yourself, folks, you'll be helping to protect this program and freedom for the world. Call now, 1-800-289-2646. 
you'll be glad that you did. Tonight's episode, part two of the interview with William Morgan, CAGI member. We have infiltrated the lodge, folks. Hear it yourself from the lips of a 32nd degree Freemason of the Scottish Rite of the Southern Jurisdiction. Well, as you probably already know, folks, we only use the very best music on this program the hour of the time. That was you, too, and I still haven't found what I'm looking for. You know, many of you write and ask why I let the music go on through the whole selection instead of fading it out and then bringing in the program. I do that, folks, out of sincere admiration and respect for the talent and the performance of the uh, writer of the music, the lyrics, and, of course, those who perform. Uh, I love music, if you haven't guessed that already. Tonight is part two of our interview with William Morgan, and many of you are wondering if that's his real name. No, it is not. We protect CAGI members. Uh, we never know, we never tell anyone how many CAGI members we have, where they're at, what their names are, anything. None of that information is given out, not even to other CAGI members. Now, we use the code name or the pseudonym of William Morgan simply because the name William Morgan is significant in the past of uh, the, <laughs> the uh, secret society called Freemasonry. William Morgan was murdered by Freemasons after having revealed, printed in a book, some of the secrets of the Lodge, and this was done back in the 1800s. Of course, the Fraternity of Freemason denies that they murdered William Morgan. However, uh, their version differs significantly from the official version and from the proof and the evidence that we have uh, spent many, many hundreds of man hours digging up and one of these nights we're going to do a program just entirely on the murder of William Morgan. Uh, Will, welcome back to the Hour of the Time. Thank you, Bill. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, um, I'm really proud and happy to be here and doing what I'm doing. You know, I don't think uh, a lot of people realize that you're risking your life by doing this. The oaths that you have taken uh, albeit uh, because they were fraudulent, you thought that you were making an oath to uh, the God of the Bible, and in fact you were making an oath to Lucifer, which, which nullifies those oaths, but um, they still, the Brotherhood, the Order, the Illuminati, the Freemasons, uh, could still carry out the threat of those oaths, which is murder. Is that not correct? Absolutely correct. Uh, no matter what I may personally feel about or what common law or the actual law may view about those oaths as taken, the Masons that are involved consider them to be absolutely uh, uh, applicable to uh, any transgression. And uh, they have been enforced, and uh, the uh, blood pun bloody punishments that are part of the oaths have happened to Masons before, and uh, they will happen again, I'm sure. Now, you, you are what degree? Let's get that out for the people in case we have some new listeners tonight. What degree are you? I am a 32nd degree Freemason of the Scottish Rite of the Southern Jurisdiction of the United States. And what is the, uh, the official title of that degree? Uh, the official title is the Sublime Prince of the Royal Secret, and uh, that is not only the title of the degree, it is also the title of the ritual that uh, the degree is conferred to. And uh, just to show you how important that is, um, after going through the ritual and getting the degree conferred upon me, I could neither remember anything sublime or even remember what the secret was that they told me. <laughs> uh, why, why is it that, that you couldn't remember um, the secrets of the, of the degree? Well, um, that's a bit of a long story, and I, I won't go entirely into it, but it started off uh, the day I was conferred, uh, began at 6 o'clock in the morning, and they just rushed through it. There was no memory work to do as in the Blue Lodge where a person has to memorize the ritual and then give it back. You just sit there and received in an audience-like capacity. Uh, and uh, when it came to swearing the oath, you merely held up your hand and said, I do. Um, you also did take that oath on kneeling on, on one knee as you did in the Blue Lodge. Now, uh, we talked yesterday uh, after uh, we aired the after we recorded the uh, the last program that aired I believe Friday uh, on WRNO and this will air on Monday on WRNO it will air at a different date on WWCR uh, so if you're listening on WWCR don't let these dates confuse you but uh, uh, we talked and, and and I asked you specifically if there was a part of Freemasonry where you 
raised your arm to the square. And what, what was your reply? Uh, yes, there there is a part where you raise your arm to the square. Uh, the first time I remember doing that action was in the second degree when it was conferred upon me. You raise your right hand as if you were swearing in. Uh, uh, actually, it is exactly the same position as if you're swearing in a court of law. Your left hand is placed flatly upon the Holy Bible or whatever holy text that, uh, depending on the lodge you're in, and your right hand is held at a right angle with the uh, arm extended, and a uh, an actual square like a like an engineer square is uh, held around the uh, elbow of the arm. It's you're swearing in a square within a square, so to speak, as the ritual says. Now, if if a Freemason were speaking in front of a group of what what Masons call the profane, would it be uh, fair to state that if the speaker uh, stated uh, something about uh, when he raised his arm to the square uh, that this could be a recognition signal to notify other Freemasons in the audience that he was indeed a Freemason? Knowing what I know, I could hardly see it as anything else. Uh, there's no square involved in any other uh, oath swearing ceremony that I've ever heard of, ever, not in a court of law. Only a square is involved in masonry. It's one of the uh, it's one of the primary tools that are symbolically referred to in all the ritual of the Blue Lodge. Now, many of you have heard this uh, this statement made by someone that uh, that you all listen to, uh, and I want you to make that connection for yourselves. If you can't, there's no. If you can't make that connection for yourself, then there's no need to telling you any more about it anyway. Um, uh, let's get into some of the uh, ceremonies. How does this start? It, it begins in the Blue Lodge with the with the first degree of entered apprentice, and it goes up. And you've actually traversed 32 degrees of initiation. Are there side roads off of this? Um, yeah. W well, it's a it's a bit difficult. The Blue Lodge is where everything begins, and the Blue Lodge where Mason is initiated at is called the Mother Lodge from that time after, uh, in specific reference to him personally. Now, once you get past the third degree, become a Master Mason in your Blue Lodge, you are able to hold an officer or, uh, or hold a chair as an officer inside the lodge, uh, and uh, you you can spend up to ten years going through the chairs and becoming an officer. But uh, after that, um, you can either go to the Scottish Rite or the Yorkish Rite. There's a fork in the road of masonry, and the Scottish Rite is by far the most popular and undoubtedly the most powerful. Now, the York Rite is, uh, has seven degrees, is that true? True. The highest, oh, excuse me, the highest of which being the uh, Knight Templar degree. For all those people out there <laughs> who think that the Knights Templar are in no way associated with masons, you're dead wrong and you haven't done your homework. Uh, in fact, the Knights Templar, when they first began as an organization on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, were not an order commissioned or ordained or approved or even recognized by any church, much less the Catholic Church, but were, in fact, an order of the mysteries. Uh, they began with seven degrees, and the seventh degree was the highest degree. And later, as they added degrees, uh, when the, uh, the Knights Templar uh, were persecuted and um, um, in fact many of them were put to death others were driven into hiding in other countries and in some of the countries they just changed their names and continued the order uh, and uh, uh, they eventually reached a, a, a number of degrees which was 33 and uh, I took that right out of a very old uh, textbook on the secret societies, which we'll talk about uh, some in a later program, and we'll get into that. But uh, what is the significance that you've been told of the system of degrees? Why do you have to go through this? Um, it's considered a road. It's considered a road to uh, quote unquote illumination. Um, I, I really believe that it, it, it's more of a system of control and self government. Uh, lodges are, are, are pretty uh, unique in America in that they are self sustaining and self governing, even with their own bit of enforcement. All lodges have been granted a, a charter from a Grand Lodge, and every Grand Lodge in this country has been granted a charter from the United States government to operate on its own and enforce its own, uh, its own laws and constitutions. Institutions. If a police officer or any law enforcement officer walks into a lodge while in session, he, uh, he not only does he not have arrest power, but that lodge immediately closes. Now, this is something the American people don't know about. Now, if these are lodges, they're in states, they have nothing to do with the federal government. How could they receive a charter from the federal government saying that they're under their own laws? And uh, how could it be the law enforcement officer would not have the authority 
uh, to arrest or, um, uh, or any of his other um, authorized duties in a, a Freemasonic lodge. It, it beats the hell out of me, Bill. It, it's really a bit of a, a, a contradiction in terms. You have a government that has actually gone out and uh, uh, given government-type status to a completely and secret uh, and, I think, subversive organization right under its own nose. Uh, you, uh, the similar thing uh, can be seen in the uh, in the Mormon Church uh, and in other secret societies that are not nearly so famous uh, as Freemasonry itself. Um, the the government has, by granting this charter, uh, I believe, uh, undermined its own stability as a as a functioning organization. Well, tell us about this charter again. Tell us tell us again what you said before. I don't want anyone to miss this because it's very important. It shows how a secret government can be formed. It shows tells that these members of these secret societies literally have diplomatic immunity um, and and can get away with whatever they want to get away with. Not only that, but they have their members sitting in the most powerful posts both within uh, society on local levels in local cities, local uh, counties, and state governments. Uh, in the higher echelons of the military, and they permeate all the positions of control within the bureaucracy of the federal government. So tell us what this charter is again. Um, okay, it is a, uh, it's a document put out by the, by the federal government, and it can be any government in the world. Uh, uh, to my knowledge, every government in the, in the world has granted that has lodges in it, has granted a, a sovereign charter to the, the Grand Lodges under its jurisdiction. Um, uh, I really haven't done enough research to speak at length on the nature of the charter or, uh, or or what it exactly implies universally for Freemasonry, but I do know for a fact that a law enforcement officer, and we have many law enforcement officers in our lodge, from state troopers to, to policemen to uh, military policemen, uh, they're not cops when they walk into the lodge. They're, they leave their power, their, their badges, and their guns outside, and they do so willingly. Uh, one of the uh, that's a that's a pretty good example, but I think the best example comes from the Knights of Malta. And here's another one for you guys out there that haven't done your homework. I'm reading from the glossary of a book entitled Freemasonry: A Celebration of the Cl of the Craft, uh, which is put out by the craft itself, and it defines Knights of Malta as a Christian Masonic degree based upon the medieval knights' hospitallers and emphasizing the Christian value, Christian virtues. Uh, well, you can leave the Christian out of it if you like, but. What's interesting about the Knights of Malta is they actually do have diplomatic immunity uh, as an organization. They can bring goods in and out of this country without going through customs, and they cannot be arrested or they cannot be detained or charged with any crime by any law enforcement officer in the country. They are they're above sovereign. As far as I know, they're above most government officials that are in the land. That's a fact, and they actually carry diplomatic passports. I know several uh, people personally who are members of the Knights, uh, the Sovereign Order, the Military Knights, of Malta, and they carry diplomatic passports and are, um, they began as citizens of the United States of America. Now, uh, what happens when a police officer, and most police officers we have discovered, are, are at least the ones who make uh, a law enforcement a career, and uh, most, if not all, judges sitting upon benches in this country are Freemasons. What happens uh, when you're speeding down a highway? and uh, you're stopped by a, a law enforcement officer, what happens when he sees the Masonic emblem on your windshield? Um, usually what you have is a direct turnaround in attitude. I myself am a young man. I, uh, uh, I, uh, I, I get hassled by cops uh, a little bit. Uh, it seems like they always have cop an attitude when they pull me over, but when they see the Masonic square encompasses on my car, and most importantly when I flip out my uh, dues paying card, a card that all dues paying Masons carry, uh, the police officer, uh, well let me just put it this way, I've never once got a speeding ticket or a traffic ticket or have even uh, been harassed in any way when they have known that I am a Mason. It's just, it just has not happened. That is, that is my personal experience. So the justice system in this country doesn't really work and Freemasons are in effect exempt from the laws that the rest of us are supposed to follow. Is that true? Uh, yeah, that can that could be probably construed as, as, as accurate, uh, Bill. Uh, uh, although I disagree, it does work. It just doesn't work the way you, most people think that it works. It works for them and with them and around them, and it works on the rest of you. That's right. Now, what happens when a Freemason goes into court against someone who's not a Freemason and the judge is a Freemason? Um... Okay, well, you have a very subtle inter interaction that goes on. All Masons are taught secret signs and secret words and secret phrases by, and, and this is some of the most, uh, 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 this is what they don't want revealed more than anything else. 
uh, you can stand in a particular position, you can hold your arms in a particular position, you can speak certain words, the widow's son, traveling man, key words and phrases that will let this judge know that you are a mason. And uh, you can almost guarantee that he is a mason too, or else he wouldn't have been able to uh, lock down a lasting career in the judiciary. That's correct. Um, and that would explain why some people just don't seem to ever get prosecuted for anything, and others who uh, may commit the same crime or a, a much lesser offense uh, seem to be inordinately uh, punished, uh, given such a heavy burden of punishment, while others who have done the same thing uh, receive either a nothing or a pat on the wrist. Well, brothers look out for each other. It's just the way the system works. It's a, it's a buddy system. It's a you scratch my back, I scratch yours. Uh, as a matter of fact, in the, obliga in the oath that a mason swears, he swears that uh, he will uh, uphold and defend uh, a mason, a fellow mason, in any, any problem that he may encounter, treason and murder alone accepted, but they left at their election, which means that even if uh, a fellow mason is a traitor to his country, uh, we know that could never happen, uh, if he's a traitor to his country, his brother mason has his own choice whether he wants to turn him in or not. He is not obligated to do so, and uh, uh, obeying the laws of masonry above the laws of the land, he's probably not even going to consider it. So, in other words, one way of infiltrating and controlling our society and our government, both on a local, state, and national level, and the military is for one of the uh, Freemasons to get into a position where he can then appoint or hire Freemasons below him. When people come to apply for that job, who gets the job? Uh, that's self-explanatory. The Mason will get the job every time. Another part of the oath is that uh, you will look out for the interest of your brother Masons in whatever capacity they may be in. Uh, in fact, it could probably be construed that not giving the job to a brother mason would bring serious repercussions if discovered inside the lodge and may even be a violation of the oath there you go folks uh, all of you who've been telling me that i'm full of crap and that i don't know what i'm talking about and that they haven't infiltrated and appointed their members below them and literally taken over all levels of society uh, both local state and uh, federal and the military uh, you just heard it from the lips of a 32nd degree Freemason. That is exactly how they do it, and that is exactly what has been done. You have to understand that since this country was conceived and, and brought into reality, uh, Freemasons have controlled it. And uh, their goal always, from the beginning, was to bring about a one-world totalitarian socialist government. Our forefathers knew full well the foibles of human nature. And this country was described in their own words as the great experiment. And the experiment, folks, was to find out if we truly could be responsible, could rule ourselves, would not give in to the foibles of human nature and give our country and our individual freedoms and rights away. But they knew when they did it that that's exactly what would happen because they were, they were, the, probably the best at understanding human nature of anyone that I've ever read and I've read all of their writings and letters and works and the Federalist Papers and everything else that they've done and they knew full well that this people would give away what they built and they knew that if we could be responsible if we would not be apathetic if we would not cave in to the desires of socialism uh, to the weaknesses of human nature, that this would have been the New World Order. We have failed, not them. They gave us every chance, folks. So don't get mad at our forefathers. Um, is this, would you concur with what I've just said? I couldn't argue with you, and I wouldn't want to start an argument with you, Bill. Uh, I have heard uh, higher-level Masons refer to the United States in their writings and in person as a Mason nation. They, uh, it is erected by them. If you look at the signers of the Declaration of Independence, if you look at the forefathers, you'll see uh, you'll see who who was involved at the very beginning of this thing. And then that, I'm not saying that all our forefathers are bad or evil. They certainly are not. They created the greatest nation ever known to man. But some of them were Illuminati, and there's just there's no denying that the course that they set us upon was uh, in 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 the end self defeating for us. Okay, folks, don't go away. We've got to take our break. I'll be right back with William Morgan after this very short pause. Hello, folks. This is William Cooper once again for Swiss America Trading. You know, as a 
Creedence Clearwater Revival, before you accuse me, you better look at yourself. <laughs> Boy, does that apply on this program, you Freemasons out there. All members of all the secret societies that are subverting the Constitution of the United States, the Bill of Rights, I call them cockroaches. I don't know what the rest of you call them, but uh, that's what they are. They claim to be looking for the light, but every time you turn the light on them, they, they scurry under the sink. Uh, run for cover. Uh, you know, it, it occurs to me that I, I need to tell you folks out there something. This young man who's on this program is a member of the Citizens Agency for Joint Intelligence, and there are literally hundreds of brave men and women all over this country and the world who are gathering information, bringing the truth out into the open. We are all working for freedom. It is the largest and most successful civilian intelligence gathering organization in the world. And our goal is freedom, to preserve freedom in this country, the United States, preserve the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, because it's the last bastion, the last wall between us and freedom, and try to institute freedom in all of the rest of the world. That's our only purpose, our only purpose. We are in support of freedom for all peoples, all peoples, everywhere. This young man on this show has risked his life to tell you what he's telling you tonight, and if his identity were ever to be discovered, he could be murdered by the secret societies that he is revealing. He is one of my heroes. Most of the people in Kaji who are helping us to do this, most of them working in intense secret, in dangerous situations. We have people who have infiltrated satanic organizations and are feeding us the information on their rituals and who they are and what they're all about. And the instant that they were to be discovered, they would be murdered. You don't seem to understand that this organization that I built, the Citizens Agency for Joint Intelligence, is vital, is vital to the freedom of the United States of America and to the world. The governmental intelligence agencies are in the control of the secret societies and are not working on our behalf and never have been, folks. I hope you understand that. Let's go back to Will. You've got something in front of you, uh, and I believe it's a list of Freemasons throughout history uh, that people would recognize their names, and if they don't readily recognize their names, they could go to any reference book in... Uh, and find these names and their biographies in any library. Um, would you like to uh, tell our listening audience uh, who some of these people are? Uh, yeah, there's some really uh, names that uh, you'll really recognize here. But before I do, let me thank you, Bill Cooper, for reminding me that my brothers might murder me just for telling the truth. Um, here's one. Colonel Buzz Aldrin. Simon Bolivar. Uh, Omar Bradley. Edmund Burke. Richard Byrd, Kit Carson, um, Walter Chrysler, Buffalo Bill Cody, Ty Cobb, Winston Churchill. Uh, the list just goes on and on. Gordon Cooper, Edwin Drake, Jack Dempsey, Cecil B. DeMille. You know, you mentioned Winston Churchill, and uh, one of the things that uh, that the listening audience don't that does not know is that not only Winston Churchill was a Freemason, but so was Harry Truman and so was Mr. Stalin. So when they had their meeting at Yalta, here was three 33rd degree Freemasons deciding the fate of the world. And for all of you who couldn't figure out why they made the decisions that they made at Yalta that so screwed up the world, now you know. Uh, please continue, Will. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. Yeah, they should have just held that Yalta meeting in a lodge and been a bit open about it. Um, Okay, here's some uh, here's some more for us. Uh, Duke Ellington, Henry Ford, Benjamin Franklin, Clark Gable, John Glenn, uh, Glett, uh, Richard Gatling, inventor of the Gatling gun, Samuel Gompers, uh, Prince Hall, Manley Palmer. Uh, oh yeah, Joseph Guillotine, who invented the guillotine. We'll be seeing more of that later. Uh, oh boy, <laughs> there's just simply not time. Edgar Hoover, uh, Sam Houston. Oh. For those of you who did not understand his reference to, uh, we'll be seeing more of the guillotine later, when the New World Order actually succeeds in taking control of the world, executions will be public, and the secret societies believe in blood atonement. In other words, you can only atone for your wrongdoing 
by your works or by the shedding of your blood, blood atonement. So in these public executions, there will have to be the maximum amount of blood. Public uh, executions will be held as a le object lesson to the rest of the population not to oppose the New World Order, for it is uh, the most terrible, terrifying uh, experience to see someone uh, literally beheaded uh, is intended to cow uh, everyone else and is, in fact, will be, in fact, a uh, ritualistic sacrifice uh, to the god of the secret societies who we all know now is Lucifer, also known as Satan. Yeah, you know, Bill, it just dawned on me just what a fun guy you really are. Uh, here's, <laughs> here's, some, uh, here's a short list of presidents of the United States who have been Masons. George Washington, James Monroe, Andrew Jackson, James Polk, or, or, yeah, James Polk, James Buchanan, Andrew Johnson, James Garfield, William McKinley, Teddy Roosevelt, William Taft, Warren Harding, Franklin Roosevelt, Harry Truman, Lyndon Johnson, Gerald Ford, and I also know for a fact that George Bush is a Mason and that Ronald Reagan was made a Mason on sight. Uh, <laughs> Like I said, the list just goes on and on, and uh, these are not even a partial, partial fraction of a percent of the famous Masons that have existed throughout history. Well, John Wayne was a Freemason, wasn't he? The Duke. The Duke was a Freemason. Absolutely true. And, uh, you know, we're not in any way belittling the accomplishments or the contributions to society of any of these people. We just wanted to let you know that this covers all areas of society, all levels of society, all occupations, and that many famous people whom you all recognize uh, have, have been or are uh, members of these secret societies. Now, many of them are taken in as window dressing. In other words, they don't really know what they're a part of. They're told that it's a fraternal uh, organization existing for the good of the community. And, of course, in any organization, if you can get famous celebrities to belong, that's a feather in your cap because the public, for some reason, thinks that if a celebrity belongs to something, then there can be nothing wrong with it. What sheeple? What, what total crap? But that's the way uh, people believe. Um, that, that's absolutely true. Most of the celebrity names that I mention in this list are there just simply as window dressings to give, to give a good appearance to the craft, but some of them absolutely are not. And I'm reading for, still from, the, from this uh, book published by a Masonic Publishing Company, and it states that Joseph Smith, founder of the Mormon Church, was absolutely and undeniably a Freemason. Uh, did you find Giuseppe Mazzini in there? Yeah, I sure did. I should have done the homework. It's Giuseppe Mazzini, 1805 to 1872, Italian patriot. He was also uh, one of the, um, the uh, best friends and correspondents of Albert Pike, who was the head of world Freemasonry for a while and the head of the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry in this country. He established uh, with others the Ku Klux Klan, um, the branch of Freemasonry known as B'nai B'rith, which uh, the ADL operates out of. And the ADL, folks, for those of you who don't know it, are under intense investigation now for spying upon agencies and, um, and departments of the United States government and police uh, departments and actually stealing records and passing them on uh, to the secret societies and to the state of Israel. So uh, you'd really better wake up out there and don't, don't give me this stuff that it's the Jews, that it's the blacks, that it's this, it's that. It's not. It's not. Ordinary people like you and me, I don't care what their skin color is, I don't care what their religion is, are just like you and me and all they want to do is live in peace. There are elements and organizations and people belonging to all the different ethnic groups, all of the different religions, all of the different organizations, corporations, governments, anything that you want to name belong to these secret societies. The Jews have been used as scapegoats throughout history. The Freemasonic organization and the secret societies in general are racist. They believe that the, um, the races, uh, the white Caucasian races in uh, Europe, Germany, uh, England, uh, uh, are the superior race, are the real Israelites. Uh, they are the ones who have orchestrated and brought about the state of Israel. They are the ones who, um, who maintain the force of Zionism active in the world. Uh, the Mormon Church is a great part of this. Uh, you will, 
I mean, if you just get down and dirty on this, you'll find that what I'm telling you is absolutely true. And one of their main weapons that they use against us is to divide us against each other so that while we're running around stabbing each other in the back, they are putting the chains on all of us. And when are you people going to realize that and understand it? All during the Cold War, there were no Russian families sitting around their table plotting on how to do away with Americans, and there weren't any American families doing that either. All of us were concerned with our children, with putting food on the table, with ed educating our children, with trying to build some kind of a good life. That's all that ordinary people care about. It doesn't matter what race they belong to, what religion they belong to. Bravo, Bill. If there's a lesson that the listeners can go home with, it is, it is that stop this racist divisionism, come together, and see the enemy for who it is. Uh, I should, like I said on the last program, you cannot, be a, you cannot enjoy the protection of the secret societies forever. With a little bit of homework, you can find out who financed Hitler in World War II. And uh, anybody that had knows history knows that as soon as Hitler got to where he was at in power, who did he initiate a pogrom against? It wasn't just Jews. He got rid of all the Freemasons who were the window dressing in, the, in, in Germany and in Austria, who put him where he was at and protected his interests. He zapped them. He nuked them. They were gone. They joined the Jews and the gypsies in the concentration camps, and they were never heard from again. And to this day, uh, many German Freemasons were a small flower on their lapel in remembrance of that tragic event. You cannot enjoy that protection forever. You are doomed to fail if you depend on these people for your life. That's correct. And remember, the primary method that they use is this. Conflict creates change. They create the conflict that they know will bring about the solution that they want. They get it to appear as if the people are screaming for the solution, and then they give it to them, <laughs> something that the people would never have accepted in the first place. But remember, conflict creates change. They believe in the Hegelian principle of conflict uh, uh, resolution. You have a thesis, an antithesis, and these the clash of these two creates the solution to the problem which they've been aiming for all along. Uh, now you also have to understand that controlled conflict creates desired results or change. So the method of bringing about controlled conflict is to have your people leading both sides of the conflict. So when you talk about Republican or Democrat, forget it. At the highest level, they're both the same. When you talk about populist versus communist or whatever it is, forget it. At the highest level, they all belong to the same organization. When you look around in the patriot movement, remember most of the leaders in the patriot movement are on the same side and belong to the same organizations as the leaders of the secret societies that are trying to destroy this country. The conflict between the two, which they are trying to create now, will ensure the destruction of the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and then they will step forward with the answer. A thousand years of peace under the United Nations, but you're going to have to make concessions to get it. You're going to have to give up your freedoms, your individual rights. But they will protect you. If you buy that, folks, you are indeed a fool. Does this confirm what you've discovered in your quest for the truth? It certainly does. It is history repeating itself with empty promises of, of, of nirvana and utopia on earth that has never come true, and you always have to be the one to pay for it. Always. Uh, uh, it's... It's just these people do not believe in a fair fight. They do not join a race that they have not fixed. It is, they, just, they, they don't take those kind of risks. Okay, I've got, you've got about 10 seconds. If you had the ability to say something to the American people and to the world, what would it be? Uh, it would be the wake up, folks. Look, uh, you've got an enemy out there. They're coming together. And there's a convention of Southern Baptists that have, uh, that have uh, come against the Freemasons meeting in Houston in 15, 16, 17 of June of this year. I suggest that you look into that. That's right, folks. And good night. Thank you, Will, for being our special guest and for putting yourself in danger for all of the rest of our freedoms and for freedom of the, of the world. Uh, I, for one, appreciate that. You are my hero. Good night, and God bless you all.